Great. So I have the privilege of introducing our speaker for the night, Dr. Cesar Briseño. He is an associate professor of clinical ophthalmology at the University of Pennsylvania. He completed his undergraduate studies at Harvard University and his medical degree at Johns Hopkins University, followed by training, residency training at the University of Southern California and fellowship training in oculoplastics at the University of Michigan under Dr. Christine Nelson. He serves as the Assistant Dean of Diversity and Cultural Affairs and Advisory Dean at the Perlman School of Medicine, as well as the Medical Director of the Shi Ai Institute at the Penn Presbyterian Medical Center. He has been an advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion in ophthalmology, serving as a, a founding executive committee member of the Minority Ophthalmology Mentoring Program of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and a founding member of the AAO LGBTQ Plus Interest Group. Dr. Briseño has spoken and published nationally on LGBTQ Plus inclusion in ophthalmology and is committed to promoting diversity in the surgical subspecialties. So without further ado, Dr. Briseño. Thank you so much, Kayla. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. This is amazing. I mean, the fact that this exists is pretty remarkable. I mean, uh, you know, back in the dark ages when I went to medical school and the internet had barely been invented, like this was a pipe dream. So this is incredible. So uh, really kudos to all of you for uh, doing what I know is a lot of work and uh, for really disseminating it so broadly um, in such a, an accessible platform. Um, I've been invited today to speak with you a little bit about my subspecialty, uh, which is ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery or oculoplastics or oculofacial surgery. It has a million names. And um, with its varied nomenclature and its sort of mysterious kind of place within the world of ophthalmology and plastic surgery, I think when I was a medical student, I certainly didn't really understand what it was um, and what it was all about and why it mattered. And so my intention for tonight is to speak with you a little bit about the specialty and kind of what it is that we do with some boring slides. And then um, after that, to really have uh, more of an open conversation, just kind of in an ask me anything format, and you can you know, put your hands up or however you like to do this, um, you know, to really uh, talk about the things that are in your mind, because I think that's far more interesting. So um, you know, the things that I will talk about at the beginning, you can see in a textbook. You know, the rest is, I think, a little more engaging and probably a little more memorable. So without further ado, I'll share my screen, my very um, plain slides that I'm gonna share with you. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about just the nitty gritty about what oculoplastics actually is. So, um, you know, these are our objectives. We're gonna answer the burning question. Well, at least it was for me when I was a medical student, what the hell is this? You know, what's oculoplastics and why do people do this? And um, we're gonna talk about several conditions that um, are commonly managed by oculoplastic specialists. So it's a subspecialty within ophthalmology. There are other ways to get to oculoplastics. Some people from plastic surgery do an oculoplastics fellowship because they love what we do, but the vast majority of us are ophthalmologists. We deal with the face, eyelids, orbit, and lacrimal system. And so in essence, we are dealing with the supporting cast for the eye. So the eye, in order to do what it needs to do, it needs to be positioned very, very specifically within the orbit. It needs to move in certain directions. It needs to be protected from the outside world. Um, it's byproducts need to be drained properly. Um, and all of the anatomy that exists in the eye socket, the lids and the lacrimal system is subject to the same pathology that the rest of the body is. So that includes trauma, infection, tumors, uh, inflammations and the like. And so we are in charge of dealing with all of that. Um, this is a specialty that handles really the gaze and the appearance and the face. So by its very nature, we're dealing with aesthetic issues. So we really dabble in both cosmetic and functional surgery, depending on which practitioner you speak to, they may focus more on one side than the other. But I like to say that every case we do is an aesthetic case because you're dealing with someone's face. And so that's really, really crucial uh, to what we do. And, um, and it's a lot of the reasons that a lot of us choose oculoplastics because of the sculptural and artistic component that is involved in it. It's um, generally a two-year fellowship after residency. Uh, the accrediting body is called a SOPR, so the American Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, uh, accredits certain fellowships. Um, Nowadays, there's probably more than this, about 20 available per year. So it's a pretty small specialty. And um, with that, without further ado, we'll take a look at some of the conditions that we take care of and, you know, kind of our day to day or week to week may become a little bit more clear. Um, so the anatomy, um, the eyelid is very thin. Uh, it's really just a couple of millimeters thick. But within that, there's a whole universe and uh, and we deal in it. So, you know, looking at it from outer to inner, you know, in this more anterior portion that we call the anterior lamella. You have the skin um, and the orbicularis um, 
the orbital rim of the bone and the orbicularis muscle, which is responsible for closing your lid. Beneath that, you then run into some fat, which is um, the preoperatic fat pad. There's something called the orbital septum, which is kind of embedded in front and sort of within that fat pad that protects the orbit, which is the eye socket from the outside world. So you may have heard of a term called orbital cellulitis versus preceptal cellulitis. This is the delineation between infections in the outside world and infections in the inside of the orbit where they become significantly more serious and vision threatening. Um, there is musculature in there. So the levator muscle and the Mueller muscle are responsible for elevating your lid. Um, the levator epineurosis is basically the connection from the muscle belly all the way to the front of the eyelid where it kind of enacts its motion. Um, and then there's the tarsus, which gives the eyelid its structural integrity. And that exists somewhere around here. And it has glands in it that produce oils. When they become plugged, you get a sty. So that's what chalazion is. And it's a really, really important little tiny piece of tissue because although it is somewhat cartilaginous in its texture, it is not in fact cartilage. It's a unique, very unique actually piece of tissue that we guard very zealously because without it, the lid really tends to malfunction. Um, and then of course, at the very back of the eyelid, you have the conjunctiva, you know, which you know from conjunctivitis, right? So it's what can get inflamed or infected that gives you pink eye. Well, the lining of the eyeball sort of wraps around and also becomes the lining of the inside of your lids. And so that continuous tissue that's there is something we traffic in a lot as well, because if there is scarring there or if there is undue tension from sutures that you've placed, it can actually limit how well your eyelids can move. And in some instances, it can also limit how well the eyeball can move. And so there's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving parts. What seems like a very simple kind of area of anatomy can actually become quite complex when you think about it in the surgical uh, standpoint. So um, we don't need to belabor the point here. This is what I'm helping my residents review for their OCAPs. And we, you'll get there eventually, but we're not there yet. So we're gonna go ahead and move on. So the lower lid is sort of uh, the mirror image of the upper eyelid. It's a lot shorter. And so it seems different anatomically, but there are analogs to every structure that we discussed on the upper lid in the lower lid as well. The lower lid also has a tarsus. The lower lid also has retractor muscles. It also has protractor muscles, which is the orbicularis that goes around. And there's also a septum there. And so basically they're mirror images, but one is just a little bit smaller than the other. Um, so um, moving on to sort of the lacrimal system, part of the quality of this is looking terrible, but um, we can see some key things, which is that in the orbit, right underneath your eyebrow, right underneath the brow bone right here is the lacrimal gland. And the lacrimal gland is a primary producer of your aqueous tears. So when you get something in your eye, like an eyelash or some makeup or something, and your eye starts to water like crazy, it's because this gland, by its innervation of the eye, senses that it needs to flush things out, and th thus it produces a tremendous amount of fluid. It's able to crank out a lot of fluid. And so this is the type of tearing that you get when you're either upset, kind of emotionally, or when you have um, some sort of irritant on the surface of the eye. It turns out the whole surface of the eye is full of what we call accessory lacrimal glands that make all sorts of other fluids that the surface of the eye needs in order to function properly. But for the sakes of our, of our discussion today, really, the primary fluid production happens in the lacrimal gland. And then in here, this tan structure is called the lacrimal drainage apparatus. So you may have heard of the nasolacrimal duct. It exists within your maxilla in the frontal process right behind where I'm touching on my face right here. And that is a duct that connects from your tear sac, which is in the inner corner, collecting all the tears that have been cried and that now need to be thrown away. And it shuttles them down into your nose and throat where you swallow them. So this is why if you're watching a sad movie and you start to cry, you get a runny nose, right? It happens because of this connection that's there. At least it, you should get a runny nose. If you're not, there may be a problem and we may need to have surgery for that. So that's that. The orbit. Well, the orbit is a bony socket that has all sorts of important stuff that travels through it. We will not belabor the point of all this very detailed anatomy. Eventually you will get to it. But suffice it to say that there are key muscular structures, there are key nervous structures, vascular structures that need to be in the right place and functioning in the right way in order for the eye to move and function properly. The optic canal is also in the back of the orbit, which is of course where your optic nerve enters and goes to your brain. And so anything that's pressing on that, such as a tumor or an abscess, could actually choke off blood supply to the nerve and actually cause vision loss. And so this is why when things like infections, like a mosquito bite, as long as the infection is outside, outside of the septum, it can look really hideous, but not really threaten vision. The moment that it penetrates and goes behind, then we're talking about a much more serious issue, generally requiring admission into the hospital and IV antibiotics. Um, so that's enough for anatomy. Now we're gonna talk about a very common 
problem that comes into our clinic. So looking at this picture, uh, what do you see there, Kayla? What's going on with this lady's face? Looks like she's got her, her lids are a little bit droopy. Yeah. So, you know, you look at this person's eyelids and they're literally casting a shadow onto her eye. You can see it clearly in the picture. You can see how the skin is folded over so much that it's actually pushing on her lashes and it's actually pushing them into the view of her visual axis. And so if she tries to look up or she tries to see a light that's changing when she's driving or she's looking down to try to read something, instead of seeing her target, she's seeing a shadow and then all these little hairs in the way and it's extremely disruptive. Now, the fix for this is to get rid of this excess tissue, which is what we call an upper blepharoplasty. Now, incidentally, this also happens to be the most common aesthetic procedure done in the United States. So it has both a very, very functional component for this uh, lady, as well as an aesthetic component. And so you can see here what she looks like before and after a blepharoplasty. This is a 40 minute procedure that's completely outpatient. Yes, it leads to about a week's worth of bruising and swelling, but really minimal downtime for a really dramatic change. Not only does she look a lot better, but she can see a lot better. And she's not having to crank her brows up in order to go about the world and do the things that she needs to do. So um, this person has a slightly different situation. You know, she doesn't really have skin hanging down, but you can see that she's not really able to open her eyes. So this is what we call ptosis. And that's the difference, right? Dermatocalasis is that the tissue is folding over and hanging down versus ptosis, which is the lid has an inability to fully open. So unlike the prior patient in whom we had to work on the skin primarily, in this patient, we have to work primarily on the muscle. So the aponeurosis of her muscle became disconnected from her tarsus and the lid slipped down. You can see how in order to even be able to clear her pupil as much as she's able, see her brows are cranked all the way up. That's the best she can do with you know really exaggerating her appearance. So this is a pretty profound level of ptosis. So um, ptosis itself can be what we call involutional. So it can happen with old age, like it did with that patient, or it can happen in a child. This is a child with what we call congenital ptosis. If you see the giveaway here is that the child is using a chin up posture in order to be able to clear the pupil. Because if they try to look straight ahead, the, the, the lid is going to be in the way and they don't have an ability to clear it. And so um, aponeurotic ptosis or involutional ptosis is the most common type, like that lady that we talked about. Um, here's a little more detailed anatomy of what's happening in the lid. Now with a more three dimensional view, we talked about skin orbicularis. We talked about, the, that's this red thing here. We talked about the septum, which is this kind of connective uh, tissue that separates the front from the back. And then here is the aponeurosis. So the aponeurosis of the muscle doesn't look like a red muscle belly, right? The muscle belly is behind in the actual orbit. What you see when you're dissecting through, it looks like this little wisp of basically shiny white tissue that can be mistaken for basically like wet tissue paper. And so this surgery is quite delicate. You know, you're dealing with very powerful musculature that doesn't have a very strong and very thick profile. And so you have to be really, really, really sure that you are in the right place. Because if you tether the muscle to non-moving parts of the eyelid, then the eyelid will never move normally. So there is an old adage in oculoplastics that's called ptosis is hell, which is a little bit rude to say. But the reason people say that is because this is exquisitely difficult to do, even though it looks deceptively simple. And it's one of the toughest surgeries that we do to get it right. So this is after levator aponeurosis reinsertion. So we, she did not want a blepharoplasty. She worked at the library as a volunteer. She's in her 70s. She just wanted to be able to go back and work at the library. She's like, minimal downtime possible. I just want to be able to see. And so all we did literally is make a small incision in her crease, find that levator aponeurosis, reattach it to the tarsus, and there you have it. Now her brows have relaxed and she's able to see. And she also aesthetically looks a lot better. And so um, this person has a problem, well, there's many issues going on here, um, but the primary issue is this lower eyelid has become incompetent, right? So with aging and with the descent of the face and the fat of the mid face that goes down as we get older, you can get a pulling sensation or a pulling effect that creates vectors that separate your eyelid from your eye. So if you don't have an eyelid attached to the surface of the eye, it's like having an ill-fitting wiper blade in your car, like it cannot clean or move the fluids on the surface of the eye properly makes you have risk for infections and irritation. And so this is what's called an ectropion. So it means the lower lid is pulled outward from the eye. Um, this can be tightened uh, here. The ligament laterally can be reattached to the bone. This of course is overcorrected in the short term, but eventually will heal and look at very much like the other side where the lid is essentially just back up against the eyeball. So 
Again, simple maneuver. This procedure takes 20 minutes to do, but life-changing for people who are suffering with this condition. And a lot of the times, because these procedures are relatively simple to do, we can do them in the procedure room. You don't necessarily even have to go to the operating room, which is very convenient for these folks. Um, this is the opposite. This lid, instead of turning outward, is turning inward. So when you happen to have the bad combination of having a lax lower eyelid, but still a very strong orbicularis muscle, the muscle, when it contracts, overpowers the eyelid and folds everything inward like a scroll. And so then you get these eyelashes that are rubbing right up against the cornea. And anyone in this call who's had a corneal abrasion knows what that feels like. And so these tend to present much more urgently than ectropion because they have really excruciating pain from this problem and um, require surgery in order to correct it. Much like the previous patient, what we do in this situation is reestablish the tightness of the ligament so that the lid can be stabilized. Um, occasionally, you have cicatricial changes that cause eyelashes to come in contact with an eye. The reason I'm showing you this picture here is because this is one of the most um, common preventable forms of blindness in the world, and it's called trachoma. So there is a particular type of um, uh, basically a, cl a chlamydial uh, strain that is um, has an insect vector. And so in certain warm parts of the world where these um, insect vectors are endemic, you can get basically recurrent infections of the ocular surface with this bug. And eventually it leads to cicatricial changes on the surface of the eye that curl the eyelashes inward. And this constant trauma of the eyelashes on the cornea, as well as the infections of the cornea itself, lead to an opaque and scarred cornea, which does not allow vision. And so this is a really serious issue um, worldwide, especially in warm places. And again, the intervention is really relatively simple, but it has to be caught on time before the eye becomes fully scarred. So for those of you interested in global work, you'll probably see a lot of this if you end up going into oculoplastics. Um, of course, we deal with tumors. So this thing right here, ulcerated, you know, kind of gnawed away, typical appearance of a basal cell carcinoma. 95% of the tumors that you're gonna see around the ocular region are basal cell carcinoma, actually an additional 4% are squamous, and the rest of the 1% includes everything else, including melanomas, sebaceous carcinomas, Merkel cell carcinomas, and all those zebras. And so by and large, you're gonna, you're gonna see a lot of basal cells in this region. Well, what's the problem? The problem is that the eyelid is a very small space. So when you really wanna take this tumor out with clean margins, you know, which we do with Mohs surgery to try to make sure that you have the smallest defect possible, even a small defect around the eye can lop off half of your eyelid, or in some instances, your entire eyelid. And so you have to reconstruct this in a way that gives you a dry, intact skin on the outside, moist conjunctiva on the inside. It should move up and down when you, close, when you open and close your eyes. All those functions have to be recapitulated, and that's what we do in oculoplastics, okay? Um, this is another example of a huge basal cell carcinoma next to this person's eye. Um, you know, a tumor like this can turn into a defect this big, so you can see this person lost about 90% of their eyelid. And so by doing what we call local tissue rearrangements or flaps, you can then take tissue that's nearby and actually move it in, pedicled on its own blood supply to then become <clears throat> the new eyelid in this region. In the short term, it looks crazy, but most of these people actually really heal quite, quite well aesthetically in the long term. And so, you know, it's really a, a key example of how, even though we are surgeons and the interventions happen in, you know, key moments, you know, that longitudinal care for these individuals is crucial in order to help them through the emotional process that this is. In the short term, it can be very disfiguring, but typically in the long term, we can do a lot in order to help them kind of re-enter their social life in a way that's relatively inconspicuous. This person has thyroid eye disease. And so you may have seen commercials for Tepeza out there, you know, in the, in the world. Um, and uh, this is an autoimmune condition that leads to fibrosis and thickening of the tissues behind the eye. And so the eye has nowhere else to go but out. And so you get this very dramatic bulging and it's extremely disfiguring, not only disfiguring, but it can lead to all sorts of dysfunction of ocular function, including double vision. And in some instances, even loss of vision. And so um, if you look at this on imaging, the telltale sign is that you have these very fat muscles. So a normal muscle should look skinny, like the one that I'm pointing to on the left-hand side. And instead you have this kind of very fat muscle belly that's very hardened. This is very typical of thyroid eye disease. We do have some medical treatments for this now, but even with medical treatment, the resolution is often incomplete and there is still a role for surgical rehabilitation. And so in these individuals, we do something called 
decompression surgery, we actually go behind the eye into the eye socket and we selectively remove bony tissue and selectively remove fatty tissue in order to make the room bigger. So it's like remodeling a house you know, to an open concept and then the eyeball can sit back into that space and you can relieve some of that pressure that the patient has. So whirlwind tour, but really basically um, in ocular plastics, you know, it's challenging because the surgery that comes to you, you don't know what it's gonna look like before the day of surgery oftentimes, especially when it's reconstructive cases. Um, you know, we saw some of the most common things that we see in our clinics, dermatic elasis and ptosis, ectropion and entropion, basal cell carcinoma, again, 95% of the tumors that we see. And the most common orbital pathology you're going to see is thyroid. Now, clearly the world of ocular plastics is far broader than this, but I thought this might serve as a quick intro to what it is that we do and hopefully spur some questions from you. So that is all I have in terms of slides. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, so as if anyone's new here, um, how we usually do Q&A is that we prioritize live questions with the raise hand function. And so if you think of a question um, right now and want to go ahead and raise your hand, we'll call on you. And then as well as take some of the um, pre-submitted questions, which I can maybe start out with one of those just to kick some things off. Um, sure. So can I ask what um, actually made you decide on oculoplastics as mm. a subspecialty? Excellent question. So, you know, when I, when I went to residency, I thought I was going to be a cornea surgeon, actually. Uh, and uh, because I just fell in love with how beautiful the microsurgical aspect of that was. Um, I still feel that way. It's still really amazing. But what I kind of didn't realize at the time about oculoplastics is just how much broader it is. So I think that for me, that is really the, the appeal. So in any given OR day, any case that I have that follows another one is something entirely different. I mean, I can go from doing a dacrocyst or an ostomy to establish to fix someone's tearing to a huge tumor reconstruction, to an orbit, back to ptosis, then to a, to a cosmetic blepharoplasty, and that's the day. So for people who are sort of scatterbrained and high energy like I am, it's great. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's very, very sculptural, and it's kind of just the discipline itself is just extremely artistic. You know, there's a lot of ways to get to a similar end. There's no two surgeons who will do a reconstruction the same way. Um, and I would never dare to say that what I'm doing is better than someone else's. I do know, however, what works in my hands. And so there's a certain level of tailoring and uh, really very um, kind of detailed artistic thinking that goes behind the work that I find very uh, rewarding and, and very fulfilling. You know, a, a lot of my residency classmates found that very frustrating. <laughs> so they did not choose oculoplastics, you know, whereas I found that actually the opposite for me was really enriching and it makes it really fun. So, I mean, to this day, I my favorite days are my OR days. Um, I just absolutely love being in the operating room. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, amazing. We have questions uh, piling up. I think, Frances, Francisco, um, you were the first. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for, for the talk. Really appreciate it, Dr. Briseño. I had a question when you were talking about the lacrimal system and mm -hmm. the lacrimal gland. So I guess my question kind of stemmed from the fact that how does fluid get made and accumulated within the gland? Is it something analogous to sort of like how the nephron works to filter out, you know, waste from the serum? And then you end no. up with the byproduct of urine. Is it something like that, or or how does it that is happen? more similar to sweat and saliva than it is to the kidney? Okay. Actually, so these are okay. eccrine glands, um, and so okay. and and apocrine glands. And so if you look at it histologically, there are you know the same kind of um, acinar structures that you would see in your salivary glands, for example, um, are present in the uh, lacrimal gland as well. It has two lobes. And so um, eventually everything coalesces into about 14 ductules that actually empty in the upper lateral fornix. So where the conjunctiva folds over inside of your lid, there are 14 little holes that are responsible for transmitting the fluid. But as you can imagine, as soon as you go past that, it arborizes, right? So it's just a huge arborized network of uh, really, really, really tiny kind of glandular structures, um, which is another reason why for example, if you get a tumor in your lacrimal gland, in your orbital lobe of your lacrimal gland, and we have to go ahead and excise it, and all you have left is a teeny bit of your 
palpebral lobe, or may maybe both are gone and all you have is your accessory glands left, people still do actually pretty well. Um, they may complain of some dry eye symptoms, but their eyes actually function quite well. So there's a lot of redundancy in the system, if you will, uh, in order to really maintain your moisture. It just so happens that for that reflex function where you're trying to like cry out a piece of dust or pollen or um, uh, an eyelash or something, that's where that gland really does the bulk of the heavy lifting. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that is, and that's sort of my question stemmed from like, how can you produce so much fluid in such a short amount of time? I'd figure well, the gland is, is rather large. Rate. Yeah, actually. Okay. And, and it only All takes, right. it only takes 250 microliters of fluid, basically, to kind of fill your fornices. Because remember, the space between your lids and your eyeball is a potential space. It's not an open space. So it really doesn't take very much to flood the surface of your eye. When you use an eyedropper, for instance, each drop that comes out has about four times more fluid in than you can actually handle uh, in, on the surface of your eye, which is why gen generally it ends up running down your face. Glaucoma patients always worry about it. They missed their drop. It didn't get in or something. It, it got in. It's fine. It's just that you only need okay. a tiny, tiny amount. So it's, it's deceptive. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for the explanation. Very insightful. Sure. We can turn to you, Tyler. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, earlier, this might be getting into the weeds, but I was curious. Uh, when you showed us the left-sided ectropian repair, you mentioned that the patient had a bit of overcorrection that would, in the long term, recede into a, a more symmetrical result. Mm -hmm. How do you know uh, mm. how someone will heal, and uh, yeah. do the angles of the cuts and stitches you make kind of shape that? In really, the really good question. And actually, it's not even in the long term. It happens quicker than you would think. So there is a certain level of feedback you have to get from the elasticity of the patient's tissue. So you don't know ahead of time until you start handling the patient's tissue and seeing how much it stretches. Based on that, you have to make a calculation. And you're right, you have to sort of like put on your you know, Nostradamus hat and think about what that's going to look like in, you know, in two months. Um, but that sense of how tissues heal comes rather quickly. So you know, as a fellow, I would say within the first six months of doing my fellowship, I had a very good sense of how much I needed to stretch and pull in order to get what I wanted to get and not overdo it. The dangerous part is stretching or tightening too much. If you tighten too much, you can get to a kind of um, uh, supra physiologic level of tension between the suture material and your tissue and the suture material can actually cheese wire through. And so you there is a balance that you have to have between the size of your suture, whether your suture is braided or monofilament, that's more like fishing line, and how tight you pull it in order to make sure that you get just the amount, the amount of tightening that you want, but not a single dime more. It's like the price is right. You can only get to the, and then no more. You know, it's like it has to get to that. And so, yeah, it is a little tricky. And that's why it's, it's deceptive. A lot of what we do looks to the outside world like it should be like really easy to do, but it, it really isn't. <laughs> I can assure you. <laughs> but it's yeah, fun. Thank you. It's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> That makes sense. Uh, I, I, I'm interested in medical education. So I was wondering, how did you learn that? Did you have like a senior fellow with you or an attending who was like supervising? I did, I did but in addition to that, I um, made tremendous use of the cadaver lab when I was a fellow. So um, I did a lot of surgery and cadavers um, in order to really, really get my bearings. And because there's a lot, especially when you do orbital surgery, you can easily blind someone. So you really had better know exactly what you're doing before you get in there. And um, fresh cadaveric specimens are by far the best way to practice that, um, you know, and uh, doing the surgeries in a stepwise fashion. So when you start learning surgery, like when you do cataract surgery, you sort of start step by step and you sort of do it backwards. And eventually when you get through the whole of the cataract surgery, then you can do it from start to finish. So in, um, that was developed at the University of Iowa and it's a really wonderful curriculum that everyone's adopted. And so um, the same is true for what we do. Um, there are certain surgeries that we do that are very stereotyped and there are certain others that are very very different from patient to patient you start with the stereotyped ones build your basic skills and work your way up to the ones that require more creativity yeah Let's see taylor taylor yeah Hi, Dr. Presenio. Thank you again for speaking. Uh, I was very interested in the eyelid tumors that you were mm -hmm. talking about and curious like what factors go in to like the surgical plan for that and what that mm -hmm. collaboration looks like with the most surgeons. Excellent question. So the collaboration is generally asynchronous, which is a little bit scary, right? Because we are often the people who diagnose the tumors because many other specialists do not feel comfortable operating on the eyelids at all. And so they may see something and they're pretty sure it's a cancer, but they'll still make you biopsy. <laughs> they don't want to deal with the misdirected lashes. They don't want to deal with all that. 
And so, um, so oftentimes that gives us, that's a, that's a good position to be in because you sort of know what's coming, right? So I usually then make the referral to the Mo's um, department. My relationship with Durham is so close that I actually have a secondary appointment in Durham. Like that's how much we work together. So um, we do research together. We do, so I generally have a conversation with the Mohs surgeon once they've had a chance to see sometimes just a picture of it. They're, they're really quite good at predicting what they think is gonna happen based on the histologic subtype of the tumor. So I have a sense ahead of time of how big a defect I'm gonna be dealing with. What I don't know is the exact shape and that size of the defect has a fairly big margin of error around it, right? It could be slightly bigger or slightly smaller. And by slight, it could be a couple of millimeters that could make the difference between you having a lacrimal system or not, right? So I generally plan for the worst and hope for the best. I book a little more OR time than I think I need. I usually try to get everyone pre-op for general anesthesia in case I need to use it. And then I just back off on the day of surgery if I need to based on, you know, if I'm pleasantly surprised by what I see. So within the realm of possibilities of what I see based on the tumor that I'm seeing clinically and the discussion that I have with most surgery, I think of the worst case scenario and I plan for that, you know, and then everything else should fall into place. It's very, very rare that I get surprised with something worse than I anticipated. Thank you, that's very interesting. Oh, and to one more thing about, so generally the asynchrony, you can do, so you don't know how, how long they're gonna be with Mohs because they do it in real time, you know, the, the, their margins. And so depending on where you are and how efficient your health system is, um, you can do that same day where they just have Mohs in the morning and come to you in the afternoon, but then you're running a risk that they may be late to the OR because they may be at Mohs longer than you think. And so generally here at Penn, we do it on two separate days. So they will have Mohs surgery and then just get a patch slapped on and then just go home, have dinner, relax. Their MPO from the morning and they come in for a scheduled surgery. And that tends to work a little bit better at least in, in, in this health system. Yeah. Um, I think I see Jeffrey. Hey, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. All right, cool. So this actually uh, piggybacks very nicely after the last question here. I too uh, like the flap surgery mm -hmm. uh, regarding um, resection of the tumor on the eyelid. Mm -hmm. So my question was, is there a certain case in which uh, your margin would end up being so wide that you can no longer uh, use that kind of procedure. And if you happen to have a larger area where the cancer is more diffuse as opposed to focal and you have wide margins, mm -hmm. um, is there a certain point where you'd have to use another procedure uh, to address so, that? Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, so there are situations in which you do not have enough tissue in order to be able to raise a flap or to raise an adequate flap to close the area. And there are limits to how much you can depend on grafts because grafts do not bring their own blood supply. And so the eyelid, we generally reconstruct as the anterior lamella, which we talked about in the anatomy discussion, and the posterior lamella, they're reconstructed separately. One of them is dry and skin-like, the other one's wet and conjunctival-like, and one of them has to bring blood supply. It, it can't be that they're both grafts because they'll both die. And so in instances where you do not have the option to raise a local tissue rearrangement, a local flap, and by local, I mean all the way down to the neck. I mean, sometimes I borrow skin from here to reconstruct this, right? So I mean. It's all fair game, as long as you're not knocking out nerves in the process, right? Sometimes I use um, the glabella, the forehead. Sometimes you have a pedicle flat from the other side, from the scalp, especially if they're bald, that you can do. So there's a lot of things you can do to make this happen. But there are people who've had a million other most surgeries, and it's just no longer an option. So in those individuals, you have to do what's called a free flap. So there are pedicled pieces of either abdomen or forearm or leg that you harvest their vessels with it bring that up to the face, anastomose it to the vessels in the face, have that heal in, and then rearrange locally once that has healed in, right? So um, free flap surgery is very complex, and it's not something that usually falls within the scope of practice of most oculoplastic surgeons. Some people do their own free flaps. I do not, um, because I didn't train to. I mainly trained in orbit. And so I usually will do that in conjunction with my ENT colleagues. And so these are pretty dramatic procedures um, that we get maybe once a quarter, people who've neglected a tumor for a very long time, or a tumor that's very aggressive, like a melanoma, where the defect is really, really huge, um, or something perhaps sinonasal that, you know, you have more of a cavity rather than a, rather than a wide, flat defect, you have a hole that, you know, the whole maxillary sinus is gone or something or whatever. And so, um, you know, in those situations, you generally want several members of the skull base team involved. Um, and uh, you can find ways to refill the volume in a way that has blood supply. You just have to take it from a distant site. Super fascinating. Thank you so much. It is really cool. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I think I see Grace. 
Hi, thank you so much. Sure. Um, you had mentioned Tepeza in your talk, which seems like a newer treatment. I was wondering if there were any other new treatments in the developmental pipeline that you're excited about. Oh, yes. To oh, yes, 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 many. Um, so there are not any that are FDA approved yet, but there are various that are in phase three of uh, development. And so um, briefly, um, the pathophysiology of thyroid disease is still not fully elucidated, but we do know that there is downstream signaling that happens when there is a dimerization of the thyroid hormone receptor and another receptor called the insulin-like growth factor receptor, right? Which is named because that's where it was discovered. It does a bunch of stuff other than insulin, but anyway. Um, so this dimerizes and the autoantibodies interact with that dimer and send these signals beyond that then forces circulating fibrocytes that normally go to areas of tissue injury. They hone in on the orbit in a maladaptive way and when they get into the orbit, they then differentiate into anomalous myocytes as well as adipocytes. So it's not so much that the tissue that's there converts into something else. It's literally new tissue comes in and grows in place, and it's abnormal tissue. That signaling cascade has a whole storm of cytokines around it, right? As you can possibly imagine, right? So some of those have been identified. And so one of them, for example, is interleukin-6. And there's another um, FCRN. And there's a couple of other... Um, kind of targets of interest that have now either already been targeted for other conditions, so they may already exist as a molecule for something else, such as cetralizumab, which is an yeah, IL-6 inhibitor and now is under phase three development for thyroid disease. And there are other novel agents that are really trying to target other parts of that pathway. One of the reasons that it's so compelling to do that is because tepertumumab, although it is ex amazingly effective at treating thyroid disease, has some pretty nasty side effects especially in people who are diabetic, as you can imagine, because if you're blocking the insulin-like growth factor receptor, it's not only gonna target the dimers, it's gonna target the regular one as well. And so you can get you know, hyperglycemic crisis and all that stuff. It's been known to cause sensory neuro hearing loss, it's been known to cause horrible IBS, as well as horrible cramping. And so like a lot of really powerful therapies, it comes with a lot of powerful side effects. And so you know, having a larger cadre of options based on that specific patient's biochemistry will really you know, empower us to really be able to do a lot without taking people to surgery. I think that that timeline for those coming out is realistically probably in the next five years. There should be at least two or three other agents um, available uh, for this. So by the time that you guys finish your residency training, it's going to look very different than it does right now. Thank you. I think I see Ethan. Hi, Dr. Bresenio. Hi. I appreciate uh, the work you've done so far in the DEI space, and I'm wondering if you could comment on either the culture of oculoplastics or ophthalmology mm -hmm. generally, and yeah. maybe any changes you think um, are being made to that culture now? Yes. So, uh, you know, my dog is knocking on my office door. Hang on a second. Let me just let her in. <laughs> there you go. All right. Hey, she's the boss. So anyway, um, so, all right. So um, loaded question, loaded answer. So, Ophthalmology is not diverse. We know that. Um, it is, uh, yeah, not in a good place in that regard. Um, and is changing for the better and very rapidly. But to give you some idea of what I mean, um, I'll talk about oculoplastics because I know that the most intimately. So Ace Opera has existed since the 60s. This organization, this is when our specialty was really born as a specialty. If you fast forward to the mid 1990s, um, the number, the percentage of the membership of ACE operas that was women was about 5%. So I'm not even talking about people of color, I'm just talking about women, right? So fast forward till now, our membership is about 25% female, right? So that's a lot of change in a relatively short amount of time, but we still have a long way to go. That doesn't really even begin to talk about diversity in all of its other forms, but it just gives you a, a, a metric, just a barometer of kind of where we are. As far as how the culture of the field is, I have to say that it, I was pleasantly surprised by it. I mean, I chose to be entirely out in my application process for residency because I did not want to be someplace where I didn't feel like I was welcome, right? That's a very personal choice. Everybody makes a different decision, but that's what I chose. And I did that when I applied to residency and I did that when I applied to fellowship, even though at the time there were only 17 spots in the whole country and the match rate was like 30 something percent. So I knew I was up against some pretty heavy odds that were against me. Um, but 
it was a non-negotiable thing for me, right? You know, to not, I, I really didn't have any interest in going back into the closet. That was just not negotiable. So um, that's a personal decision that everyone has to make, but it has really colored the way that I view my position within the field and especially at the national level. And so I've really felt that it is incumbent upon me to be very public about who I am and what I do in order to really show that there is some diversity in the field, right? And um, that has been actually really well received. So, you know, the MOM program has been a tremendous success. Um, you know, the pipeline for diversity in our field has exploded, you know, over the past seven years or so. Um, and the presence of an LGBTQ plus group within ophthalmology um, that took a tremendous amount of political power to make happen, um, not because I think people are inherently bigoted at the AAO, because I really don't think that's the case, but just because it is such taboo in our culture. So to give you an idea, when our group was first formed and the AAO put out information about this through their Facebook page, the amount of vitriol and hatred that came from members of AAO about the existence of this group was mind blowing. And we have a part in, if you go to AAO.org and you go to diversity, there is a section there for the AAO uh, LGBTQ plus community, even within that page where people's like names are plainly visible, you know, the amount of nonsense that, you know, we had to deal with and that it's, is astounding. But even in the four years since we've been doing this, that the tenor of that has changed so much, you know, like we have um, a symposium about LGBTQ health at AO for the first time two years ago. You know, we had a social event this year that was extremely well attended, including by the president elect and the past president. And all. so all of a sudden something that was just swept under the rug and completely invisible, you know, for decades now is essentially mainstream. And so it takes, people be willing to be at the, the face of it in order for that to happen, you know? And I think that, you know, your generation gives me a tremendous amount of hope because like, you know, it's a lot more willing and able to talk about this stuff than my generation and certainly the generations before mine. And so it is definitely momentum and movement in the right direction. I, I, I really, I feel that way. Um, you know, obviously the people writing those things in our comment sections don't feel that way but that's okay, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it's um, it's not okay, but you know, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, the point is that the momentum is certainly one in, in the direction of inclusion. And um, and I find that actually really um, encouraging. Uh, so, you know, for what it's worth. It's one person's perspective. But... Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for going. Um, we yeah. can go to you next, Emily. Emily. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Visenya, for the talk. Um, I'm curious about us, oculoplastic, uh, are there opportunities to be involved with the underserved communities here in the United States or like how much global health is there to do as well? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, the, the answer is yes. I mean, one of the nice things about oculoplastics is that we do not need a lot of special equipment to do what we do. Um, so, um, you know, I can speak to you about what I do um, because of course that's what I know best, but I know that you know, for example, there's opportunities to be involved in well-established charities like Orbis and things of that nature, um, where you can really um, uh, have literally a flying hospital that has all the amenities that you would ever want. They can do intraocular surgery and all that stuff. But the reality is that oculoplastics doesn't really need it. Um, and so what I have done is I have, through my involvement in the Pan American Association of Ophthalmology, I've actually developed all sorts of ties to um, various academic centers throughout Latin America. So I've had observers from Latin America come visit with us and I've gone there. And working with their university departments, I have gone as a volunteer to do clinical and surgical work in the far reaches of their countries, right? Because like in Latin America, as you may or may not know, generally in the capital cities, the, the state of healthcare is extremely advanced. It's just like here. The moment you step outside of that, and especially if you go to the far reaches and to the rural areas, not unlike the US, you know, access to care becomes a very serious issue. The difference is that the Delta in Latin America is a lot bigger than the Delta for us in the US. And so I went to the Atacama Desert, for example, in Chile in the North, um, where um, it's a rural community, extremely underserved, but this was under the auspices of the Chilean government. This was not under the auspices of any kind of NGO. I, I just was working with their state school and um, because I happened to speak the language and because I showed interest and because I met the right people, I was able to do it. So there's lots of ways that you can get involved either domestically or internationally 
in doing this kind of work. And oculoplastics lends itself really well to it because you don't have to bring anything with you except your hands and your knowledge. Now, within the US, I volunteer at a clinic that's primarily um, for Spanish speaking patients here in Philadelphia. A lot of patients are undocumented. Um, and there are challenges in terms of having access to operating rooms in the US. They are much more regimented in the US than they are globally. But there are still methods by which you can engage in charity care. And so what I've found to be most effective is actually to really engage my own university in that regard. So we have been able to develop a few avenues. They're limited, but they exist to provide surgical care for people who need it, who I identify when I go do my volunteer clinics in this um, other place. And so um, there are ways to do it. It is always clunky and challenging and difficult because it's expensive and no one wants to pony up the money, but the, by far the most critical factor is you as the surgeon, right? So once you're part of the picture and you're willing to do it, generally the other pieces sort of fall into place, but you have to be willing to kind of be the driver of that. And so, um, you know, and you have to kind of be okay with having small wins, right? It's incremental and it's, and it's short. It's very difficult to do it all, all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, just try your best to do good in the way that you can and the moment that you can, you know, and that's, been sort of how I've resolved to kind of deal with it because I'd like to do a lot more, but you know, my department needs me to make money for them. So there's that, <laughs> sadly. Always bridging that. It's difference. always a challenge. Yeah. It's always a um, challenge. I'd wanted to read out a question from Caitlin um, in the chat. Yeah. She says, back to the tone of the very first question, you spoke about your OR days. Mm -hmm. um, and she's asking, what do the other days in your career look like? Is there ample room for careers that span research and clinic? Uh, yes. So I, um, I'll, I'll talk about myself first and then I'll talk about my mentors. So I, um, so I've chosen within academic medicine, kind of the path of kind of education and educational leadership. That's been my kind of chosen path because it's very student facing and I really enjoy it. And so I, about 30% of my time is administrative and about 70% of my time is clinical. Of that clinical time, about half of it is surgical and half of it is clinical. So, you know, half that time I'm in a clinic, sometimes doing procedures in clinic, and half the time I'm in the OR. Now, the other 30%, which amounts to a day and a half a week, um, you know, I am either at the dean's office doing that, or I am meeting with students, advising them, or I'm doing my own research projects that I do. So just because I'm not a primarily a researcher doesn't mean that I don't engage in research. It's really crucial in order for me to guide my students, in order for them to get where they need to go. They need to be able to publish and they need to do all that stuff. This is the currency that academia likes. And, you know, I'm, I'm no fool and I wouldn't guide them any other way. I'm like, yeah, you need to do this. And so I'll do it with you. Um, but that's really my motivation. You know, I, I, I am not the type of person who's interested in running a lab, for instance. Now, within oculoplastics, there are plenty of people who do that, though. So like um, Ray Douglas, who... Um, did a lot of the foundational studies for Tepeza and um, also uh, Alon Kahana, who does a lot of work on the basic sciences of how muscles behave in the orbit. They run, you know, fully NIH funded wet labs with zebra fish models and mice or whatever the hell, you know, and all that stuff. They do all that stuff. So, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want to do. The field is broad enough and has enough angles in it that you can really kind of carve out your own niche. When we talked at the beginning of the talk about the anatomy that we deal with, even though physically it's a small space, kind of biochemically, it's a whole universe, right? I mean, you're talking about, you can do research in oncology, you can do research in inflammation, you can do research in the microbiome, you can do research in the mechanics of surgery, you can do research in the optics of vision, you can do neurological research, you can do imaging research, and all of that lends itself to ophthalmology. You know, anything that's in the skull base at all, we can touch. And so I think that there is a lot of opportunity there for those of you who are interested in pursuing that type of that type of career. The main issue is that the more research you do and the more funding you get, the, generally it takes you away from the OR, right? So it's like a lot of people go into plastics because they like being the OR. And so there's the there's the rub, right? But um, you know, you have to resolve that for yourself and decide, you know, which way makes sense for you. That sounds great. Um, we probably have time for just a couple more questions. Um, if anybody from the audience had one, um, otherwise one of our pre-submitted questions was kind of along those lines of you're wearing a lot of different hats and mm. how do you find balance between work and life? And do you have any tips? Mm. For that? You know, I mean, I think 
the tremendous benefit that we have as ophthalmologists is that by and large, we are not responsible for inpatient care, right? So we are a consulting service. And so pretty much all that I do, with the exception of seeing consults for inpatients, but again, I'm not the primary team, happens during regular business hours. So, I mean, if I leave, I, I'm also kind of a stickler for running a really efficient clinic. Like I really like to start on time and finish on time. I like myself and all of my staff to have a full hour for lunch, refresh, do what you need to do. I go do my charting. We come back at one o'clock and we go from one to five. And it's very weird if I finish after five, you know, and the same thing in the OR. Like I really like to run a tight shit. I'm really, 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 really well organized about what I do precisely because I don't want to be there forever. I have no interest in that. I mean, I really love my job. It's great, you know, but I really like my life better than my job. So like, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I really, um, I find that ophthalmology, regardless of specialty really within it, um, lends itself really well to having that type of balance, but it does require of you a tremendous amount of planning and organization. You know, there are at any given moment, a tremendous amount of forces pulling you in a million directions. And so you have to be in control. Like, I don't know how many of you have Epic in your um, health systems. Like I'm one of those people that's like a little neurotic, like my in-basket thing in Epic is like always at zero. Like, I don't like to have anything pending. Like if it comes in, it's done or delegated or whatever, but I'm neurotic about it because if I'm not, then it just piles up and it, you can never catch up, you know? And so um, so you do have to develop your own efficiencies and kind of your own style of how you manage this stuff in order to make it doable, um, you know, because otherwise it's like a noble gas. It can expand to fill whatever volume you give it, you know, the, the career can do that. Uh, and some people like that. Some people really like their career to be their whole thing, you know? and. I have all sorts of other interests, you know, like I take language classes. I like to go dancing. I like to paint. I like to draw. I like to do all sorts of other things. You know, I like hanging out with my dog. I like seeing, hanging out with my mom who lives like two hours away. And, you know, and I talk to her every day, you know, and you know, I'm just like very typically Dominican in that way. But like, you know, it's, I love it, you know, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. So, you know, I think it is a matter of choice. You have to make the choice in order to do that. Thank you so much. We have some really wonderful questions from the chat. Um, I'll, we'll see if sure. we can get through a few of them. Um, maybe if we can take two together. Do you have any suggestions for a med student that's in a med school that doesn't have a strong ophthalmology program or connections to an advisor? And yes. then as well, do you see both pediatric and adult patients? So uh, when I was at Michigan, I did. At Penn, it's actually rather segregated because our pediatric hospital is at a failing hospital. It's CHOP. You may have heard of it. It's kind of famous, but it's like they sort of do their own thing and we sort of do our own thing. We are in the same department, but all we do is cover call for each other. So we don't, I don't have clinical hours at CHOP the way that I used to at Michigan where I, I saw kids in my own clinic. Um, that's more a product of Penn than my choice, but I actually really like orbital stuff, which I don't mind being primarily adult. It's not, it's not a bad thing for me. Um, as far as the um, being in a, in a school with, that either doesn't have an ophthalmology department or that has a very small ophthalmology department, perhaps maybe primarily volunteers or something like that, is that you know you will still need to have strong scholarship in order to match into ophthalmology. That is just necessary. And so, but I think you need to take advantage of what we were discussing before. Ophthalmology overlaps with so many other specialties. And so your school will have strengths in one of the sister specialties, either in endocrine with the diabetes stuff, or in radiology with imaging, or in neurology with neuroophthalmology, or in ENT with, you know, head and neck tumors, whatever it is, you know, you latch on to whoever within that department is doing something that overlaps with ophthalmology. And because you will need your own institution's support in order to succeed in this process. Additionally, you will want to find some mentors who are ophthalmologists. Now that can happen either through the volunteer or alumni network that your school has or through the AO, you know, um, so that's another, another way to do it. You know, there's also your state societies, right? So become a member of your state society. I can't stress this enough. Usually it's free for you guys, you know, and it's a great way to go get your posters presented, give a couple of podium talks and meet a bunch of people, you know? And those are the people who could end up writing your letters. There are people who could end up taking you to the OR for you to shadow. You know, you have to build a network that sometimes is a little bit broader than what is being handed to you within your own institution if ophthalmology is not a particularly strong department within your institution. And let's be honest, it's only a few institutions in the country where that's the case. So most applicants into ophthalmology really have to go that extra mile. And so I highly, highly recommend that you do. That makes sense. Um, and thank you so much for speaking, especially on the topic of diversity in ophthalmology. Um, I think that's such an important thing to 
recognize. And we have one question in the chat that asks that only if you feel comfortable answering um, that did the did being out have any um, challenge in the process or create any challenges in the process of applying for application um, for residency and fellowship? You know, if it did, I'm not aware of them. Um, so I think that I made a conscious decision to, and, and you know, my, my program director in residency um, was also an, an openly gay Latino man. So that was just kind of amazing. Um, didn't plan that, just sort of happened. Um, but I made a uh, conscious decision to own the narrative, right? So when I went into my interviews, I started speaking about my partner and I started speaking about his needs and what we needed to do and immediate, and just like it was nothing. And then immediately switched into my review paper that I wrote and into whatever and why the surgery is so fascinating. You set the tone for what is taboo and what isn't, right? And so barring anyone of being a very vitriolic bigot, generally that sets the tone and puts them at ease. It's unfortunate that we're in a position as minorities to have to do that, but we all do it, right? Anybody here who has a minoritized identity understands what it's like to just kind of set the tone and put at ease people who are not part of that group. You know, you can either experience that and see it as victimization, or you can see that as having the power to set the narrative. And I don't know that those two are mutually exclusive, but especially when it came to my essays, interviews, and applications, I really, really tried to lean very hard into the latter, um, you know, and I think that it really um, made it a non-issue, um, which, you know, I ended up in Michigan of all places, you know, which, I mean, it's actually an extremely conservative department. I didn't know that at the time, but it never, it never was an issue, you know, because I sort of took that power away from anyone that would have used it against me by setting the narrative myself. Thank you so much. Um really for everything. And I'll turn it over to Kayla again for just closing remarks. Yeah. Alrighty, so thank you so much for a wonderful talk and just a wonderful Q&A session, Dr. Rosenio. Um, so our recording, again, it will be up on the website. We can let you all um, know, but kind of just be on the lookout for it in the next few weeks or so. And um, next month we will have a talk by Dr. Tom Johnson, who is a glaucoma specialist here at Hopkins. Um, yeah, that's pretty much, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Thanks for coming out and just, you know, wait yeah. for the next reminders for when our session is going to be next month. All right. Good luck, everybody, uh, on your respective journeys and, uh, you know, definitely don't lose heart. I mean, it is a bit of a long journey, but it's so, so worth it. So, um, good luck. All right. Take care.